um, today is a perfect day for self-reflection because it's my birthday. <laughs> Thank you. And you know, for almost a year now, Malik and I have been friends through email. We just met this evening, but it's really amazing how this network does work and um, how relationships form even in this digital age. But when she asked me to become a speaker, it was, um, it was particularly meaningful to be able to do this self-reflection in, in terms of the art of the start. And for me, the three things that I took away from the, just the description was, we're international, we're women, and it's about entrepreneurship. So if I just looked at it from that perspective, I kind of did a little self-journey of my own because I too believe that I am an entrepreneur, both a business entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur. But I also study entrepreneurs and support entrepreneurs through the work that I do at Endeavor. So I have this like, kind of three-way perspective on, on what's going on. And through this exercise of self-reflection, I realized that my whole story begins with growing up Turkish American. Now this is not so unique here because we're all somehow involved in Turkey. But what is interesting about it is that it, how it shapes and how it molds both the social choices that we make and the career choices that we make and how it ties to um, being an entrepreneur in an interesting way. Being a third culture kid, I was born and raised in the United States. I've been living in Turkey now for 15 years. Across a broad spectrum, if you took this definition of what a third culture kid is, and I know that Anastasia probably knows a lot about this concept, um, it's not just observing another culture, but really living in another culture and then ending up with a third identity. So for example, um, you know, 4th of July in, Turkey, in, in America, living in America, meant having a barbecue picnic and eating chiburek and doing folk dancing instead of playing volleyball. Like, it, it just, you know. But then we come back here, <laughs> uh, living, in, uh, living in Turkey, and you know, Thanksgiving dinners, which my friend Filiz will know, you know, involves baking a turkey and having yeshil fasulye with it. And <laughs> you know, it's just this hodgepodge of different things. Um, but beyond the food and the socializing, uh, the third culture kid, I think, has a very, very unique perspective. Because one thing that we can't do, whether you spend a little bit of time or a lot of time abroad, whether you're married to a Turk or not married to a Turk, doesn't matter what nationality you are, I think that the third culture genre of people in that broad spectrum, um, the one thing that we cannot do is stop comparing things that we've discovered. It, no matter how much we try to kind of meld them together, and sometimes we're able to do that, we always have this amazing perspective of comparison. And that sometimes drives us a little bit crazy, um, but actually, it's this huge advantage, I think, in identifying opportunities, which ties into entrepreneurship. It ties into entrepreneurship in one of two ways. One is the identification of opportunities, and the second one is in seeking kind of like-minded people and the tribal nature of an entrepreneurial initiative, actually. So T, I'm going to abbreviate, third culture kids, or TC, TCKs, I'll call them third culture kids. Uh, we feel like we belong everywhere. We have this amazing opportunity to have explored and experimented with different cultures. Um, we've observed them. We've immersed ourselves in them. Um, I think that we can pretty much get along anywhere that we, were, we would go, regardless of where we're from. Um, but we also sometimes feel like we belong nowhere. And that's where I think, again, entrepreneurship, the drive, I mean, this can, in fact, um, at some point be demoralizing, but it can also be that, that thing that compels you to act. So when I looked back to my own life, um, I realized that you know, my whole life actually, beyond the fact that I studied international relations and I studied economics and I studied business, like I studied these things, beyond what I studied, what really actually has shaped my life is this, I've been seeking an identity, like a place to belong that, that made me feel comfortable. Um, they were either value-centric or mission-based communities. So whether it was the type of work that I was doing or the type of socializing that I was doing, those things led me there. Um, and here I looked at it from, you know, when I'm with other third culture people, or it doesn't even have to be third, third culture people. If I were in Turkey and I was with a group of music lovers, that would still be a perspective. So people with perspective, with passion, and with patience, and then uh, a group of people who have like, prerequisite skills to get things done, and a sense of purpose, and those things come together. How did they come together? Okay, I'm 42, that, that's, that's the big secret. <laughs> um, 
But I realized, wow, you know, for 42 years, I've actually been either seeking organizations or creating them. Um, when I was in school, you know, the easiest thing in high school was the theater, the music, the sports, so the team things. And this is, again, not unique, but it's unique when you put it into a context. Um, through university, through high school, I was always part of this international students club, and I created the, I created the one at, at Hopkins, I created the one at Carnegie Mellon. Um, when I was in, in, in university, there were two, I went to Johns Hopkins University, which is a very engineering male school. Um, there were like 17 fraternities, I'm sure some of you are familiar with this, and there were two sororities. So the, the one sorority was Protestant, WASP, um, all the girls from the, the New Englands, and then there was another group um, that were all the Japs that were, I'm, I'm stereotyping, from, from New York. And then there were all of us, the Turks, the Asian girls, the sports players, like we just didn't fit anywhere. So we petitioned and we formed another sorority called Delta Gamma and it was like the United Nations of sororities. I mean we were, everybody that didn't fit into those groups ended up there. Um, and then I discovered entrepreneurship in graduate school which is another way of creating tribes. I think that entrepreneurship is a very tribal thing because you actually create this family when you build your entrepreneurial organization. My work, again, echoes a lot of the theme of, um, of international relations, which I feel I think is my comfort zone. So whether it's the World Bank, whether it's working in a consultancy for emerging markets, even the work that I did as management consultant is project teams or you know, corporate social responsibility was part of a movement. Like they're all related to this identity seeking, this value seeking drive. And then in Turkey, we did Turks Like Us, education volunteers, and really my, um, I didn't, I wasn't very conscious of what I was doing um, back in the United States, but when I got to Turkey, this is where I really started identifying some of the nonprofit work that I was doing as a career. I said, oh my goodness, you know, this is actually a third sector, and there's an opportunity to have a career here, there's an opportunity to do meaningful things, um, to make a living doing um, the things that I love. So within all this third, con <laughs> third culture context, I must say that it's, it's been very exciting, but the dating part continues to be a conundrum. Although, for those of you who aren't married to a foreigner and who are dealing with what I'm dealing with, I did once the study, you know, out of like close to seven billion people on Earth, um, I figured out that there are 17 soulmates for each person. The only problem is you have to find them at the right time and in the right geography. So, I don't know how that's gonna happen out of seven billion people. Um, but my newest, latest, greatest tribe, I think, it right now, um, which kind of, again, echoes a little bit what you were saying about how fulfilling a dream, what Nakia Hanum was saying about fulfilling a dream, um, is Endeavor. It's, for me, it's, Endeavor is this international organization that supports high growth entrepreneurship. So it's international, support, supports business, but it's a nonprofit organization that really relies on the private sector's kind of uh, ownership of economic development and in particular emerging market. So it has everything, a little bit of everything. It's, we work closely with the venture capital community. Um, we work with the business community, but we're really a nonprofit organization, much like Kagi there. Um, and we're working within a spectrum. So it's really the entrepreneurs that are high growth, but almost from the get-go formed as an international business idea. So it's really also being able to leverage that international network. And that's why it's so exciting to be able to collaborate with the organizations here. Just very briefly, we do, um, two sets of things. Our core work is engaging a network of Turkish, um, of business people living in Turkey who are C-level executives, professional service providers, um, established entrepreneurs, and the finance community. They link up with the network and other emerging markets, so we have this whole network going on. Um, with those people, we conduct a search, and a search and selection cycle of entrepreneurs, which is not an award. It's actually a four-phase process where the entrepreneur is constantly getting feedback, mentoring, networking support. Um, they just go through the, the, the phases at different times. But once an Endeavor entrepreneur is selected as an Endeavor entrepreneur, it's a fellowship program. Um, and that's selected at an international platform, much like a Fulbright scholarship or an Ashoka fellowship. Um, and that service program really can tap into this international network as well. But really the idea, that's the niche idea. But with those entrepreneurs and that business community, what we're really trying to do is the other part of it, which is the outreach program. The outreach program, or all the things above the line, is the role model effect. It's being able to share people's stories, all the content that we learn through education, through um, promoting entrepreneurship as a career choice, 
um, in some of our awareness programs and defining like specific projects and programs to enable entrepreneurs through partnerships and collaboration with other NGOs, with universities, with media, um, which is a lot of fun. So I hope that at some point you'll, you'll come and explore a little bit more about Endeavor. But Endeavor itself too, much like Savanj University, didn't happen in one day. Um, in the United States, it started in 1997. In Turkey, it started in 2006. But even here, when we started working on Endeavor, we had a lot of false starts. I mean, we started in 2003, wasn't the right time, wasn't the right place. We started again in 2005, and then 2006, and then 2007. It took a while to get it off the ground, and we're still constantly um, reinventing ourselves. So it is also a learning organization, and I think that that entrepreneurial nature will never end. <coughs> So having talked about kind of the international component of, of entrepreneurship, I also want to address a little bit, if you couple that with, and I think that this is the audience to, to be able to talk about this, if you couple that with the female perspective, I do believe that there's an argument to be made for women to be excellent entrepreneurs. And where does it come from? And this is, I'd like to kind of quote to a little bit of what you were saying, Yudan Hanum. First of all, women are dreamers. We dream about being thin. We dream about <laughs> marrying the right man, our weddings. We dream about a lot of things. But we're always dreaming about this world where you know, things are better, essentially, for ourselves or for our loved ones. So we're dreamers. Um, we are multitaskers. You know, we've heard this all before. You're cooking, you're cleaning, you're talking on the phone, you're typing, you're paying bills, and we're doing all these things. By nature, we are bootstrappers. We know when we have to pay our credit card bills. <laughs> um, and we also know home economics, so we have that kind of perspective. We are nurturers, obviously, just through the family and the relationships that we go through. We're ego managers, not only of our own egos, for the most part, but also the egos of the people around us. We have to manage them, so we, we have a, a knack there. Um, we're self-improvers. And I think that this is really interesting. I mean, I'm, again, really generalizing, so the gentleman in the room, please don't be mad. But um, I find that you know, when, men, when something goes wrong, um, men tend to be like, oh, it's somebody else's fault. This happened, that happened. But women are always like, oh my goodness, what did I do wrong? Um, and you know, while that's a bad thing, what, what's wrong with me? Um, while it's a self-improver on the one hand, it can also lead to you know, over-criticalness on the other hand. And we're, you know, somebody had said we like to talk. Um, we are networkers just by nature as well. And there's a flip side to being a woman as well. I mean, sometimes we're dreamers, but we also need to be grounded, so we can't be delusional. Um, <laughs> we're multitaskers, um, you know, but sometimes we need to be able to delegate, like, and ask for help. Um, bootstrappers, same thing. We need to be able to ask for help, and sometimes we don't do that often enough. Um, Ner like, yeah, when we're the, if we're not delegating, we can also be control freaks, right? So, uh, the nurture elements, yeah. The nurture element can be a little bit about being overextended. Sometimes we overextend ourselves. Um, ego managers, we tend to apologize. Sometimes when we talk, we even talk by saying, I'm sorry, but I'd like to say something. Yeah, so there's a, a spectrum of these things as well. And for networkers, I remember very clearly what I wrote next to this on my notes was, um, we're really great networkers, but we have to listen. And it's really funny that your whole, you know, practically your whole emphasis uh, was built on that theme because it is an, an ongoing theme as well. So given that the, I think that women could be this amazing entrepreneur, so we have the international element, we've got the XY factor advantage, and it becomes kind of, um, kind of this authentic place because entrepreneurship is not uh, an economic driven decision. It's not a job. Entrepreneurship is a journey. It's a mission-driven journey. And I don't know, I was you know, doing an inventory. We have now 30 entrepreneurs in the Endeavor pipeline. And I just was looking at them as well. I've discovered, and I'm, who's doing their PhD back there? Somebody is doing their PhD? Here's, I can give you some PhD data. But like, I looked and I realized that maybe 90% of them are third culture people of the successful entrepreneurs. Um, and the other part of it is that they've taken everything that they've done and they've taken it, some of it was a personal challenge, I mean some of it was a professional challenge, but at some point along the way it became personal. For you it was building the university, um, you know, all these different things, but you know, 
I can give you many, many examples. I can give you examples that have nothing to do with school, actually. I know through the university, for example, I'm sorry, through Endeavor, one of our Endeavor entrepreneurs, a woman entrepreneur, Bezirea, uh, that you'll know from BFITS. I mean, she came, she studied psychology, she was doing many, many different things, but the, this chain of, of women's sports salons that she created was a direct result of a car accident that she had, the surgery that she needed in America, and the time that she spent in rehabilitation in the United States, and that comparative perspective that she was able to bring back. So for her, it was very personal. Whereas for, um, let's say, uh, Ebru, Ebru Cherezje from Hiref, another really wonderful entrepreneur. Um, she was working at Alessi, which she's a designer, and she had a wonderful job, she had a wonderful career. She was really advancing in her career as well, but her roots kept pulling her back to uh, you know, a contemporary interpretation of, of Anatolian culture. So for her, it became personal as well. And I think that that's the difference between some things that inspire us, like we might be interested about environment, we might be interested about, I don't know, fashion, but being inspired and being compelled to act is a different thing. Um, being compelled to act means that not only have to, do you have to be inspired, but it also has to be something that's relevant for you to the point where it actually now becomes personal. Like you have to move forward. And those things, those opportunities that you're identifying are gonna come through, I don't have to read the list, but all these different things. And when I say trends there, I'm actually talking about not fashion trends, but I'm talking about like, you know, two income families or you know, women getting married later, or whatever those type of soci sociological trends are. So the science of entrepreneurship. To me, I think the art of the start, and I think this is actually mimicking um, the things that you were saying uh, in, about mindfulness and awareness, and I think that the Kyudan Hanam was talking about, beyond listening, then you have to listen, ask, internalize, and then repeat, right? And I actually even have the words here. You're going to see it. It's really funny. But mindfulness to me is, is, is a very core philosophy in terms of the art of entrepreneurship, not the science of it, the art of it. And it's really, whether you look at it from a Buddhist point of view or a Western psychology point of view, it's being able to, to look at the world around you, to understand it and what the realities of it are uh, without being judgmental, because this I've learned a few things about being a third cultural kid, and one of them is, um, is that if you deny kind of the realities that you live in, you start getting depressed. So if I keep denying the fact that a car is not going to stop when I cross the street, or if I'm going to have a temper tantrum every time I wait in line in Turkey and somebody cuts in front of me, I le that leads to depression, <laughs> right? But if you're, I mean, this is a very simple in uh, example, but if you're mindful enough and you can just look at it and say, look, this is, Turkey, and Turkey, they don't cross the street that way, or they don't whatever, um, then you can adapt. Not only can you adapt, you can start, so you can combat depression, um, but then you can start looking at what your alternatives are. And then you can design an action plan. And then you can go ahead and kind of gauge your progress without having a panic attack, um, because that's also a big part of it too, right? So as you're making progress, sometimes you're gonna have setbacks, sometimes you're gonna move forward, being able to kind of review that as well. So, if I add the art and the science, and I think that um, Azam Denizman is here somewhere, she might appreciate this too. Um, the, the mindfulness is being proactive. You have to learn. You have to continue to ask. You have to do your research. But it's being proactive about the things that you're doing. Being unique, differentiating yourself, doesn't mean being complicated. Actually, uh, the simpler, the better. Sometimes simple is really hard, and we know that from fashion, we know that from trying to write a, a, a very simple letter. Narrowing something down to its simple essence is, is actually not that easy. Knowing your audience, and I'm not talking about this from a know your target audience point of view, it's, it's really knowing your audience. Just because you think something is important doesn't mean that there's an audience for it. Make sure that that audience exists and that, that you can reach them. Knowing yourself is you know, you could actually run a hospital and not know anything about brain surgery because it's really about building a team at some point. So it's knowing what your own strengths and weaknesses are and what type of a team you're going to need. And that goes back to the science. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Situational leadership. I think that as women, we tend to be a little bit more consensus driven. We want everyone to be happy. But leadership, especially in an entrepreneurial state, depending on the type of, the point that you're at in your business or the project, 
uh, requires situational leadership. Sometimes you have to be an inspiring leader. Sometimes you need to be an authoritative leader. Sometimes you need to be a mentor. And then maybe when things are progressing to a certain point, then you can become a consensus-based leader. But you have to be able to be comfortable with wearing those different hats. Um, celebrate everything, even the setbacks, because as I said, it's a journey. If you're not gonna enjoy the setbacks as a learning experience, then and you have to get a little bit zen about it, I think. Um, and then this is the shampoo part of it. Rinse and repeat as necessary. <laughs> and we're all familiar with the back of the shampoo bottle. But the science of it is you have to build a tribe. No matter who has the greatest idea in the world, one person is not gonna build a business. Um, you have to build a team. And sometimes you can be the leader, and if it's a lifestyle business, it can be you as the leader and a bunch of junior people. But if you're really looking to grow a business, you need to have you know, talented people with you. And, and who was it that said, leaders who are tens, I'm sorry, leaders who are fives tend to hire people who are ones, twos, and threes, but leaders who are tens tend to hire people who are uh, eights, nines, and tens. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's really about having the confidence to be able to hire other smart people and, you know, and sharing that, sharing the load, but also sharing the benefits. This is critical. You have to define your cost drivers and you as an entrepreneur must understand the basics of finance. You don't have to be a wizard at making spreadsheets. You don't have to be, you don't have to study corporate finance even, but you could get an executive MBA if you wanted to. Uh, <laughs> um, but really, businesses are made or broken by cash flow management. You have to be able to manage your cash flow. You need to be able to understand that and have that conversation and not be afraid of it or allergic, or allergic to it. Second part of it is knowing your, defining your income sources. You, you need to make money <laughs> to be able to do the things that you want to do. So your income sources, diversifying them, um, is very correlated with the marketing essentials. And by marketing essentials, I mean there are some really amazing marketing people here that I'd like to talk to you. Um, digital media has made marketing tools more affordable than ever, ever before. So like, there are things that we can leverage um, very cost effectively, uh, whether it's word of mouth or whether it's digital media that we need to learn about. And then, who was it that said this? Risk, Gildan Hanum. Um, I think this ties into what you were saying before too. Prepare your business plan uh, from the bottom up, you know, Pay attention to competitive environment, et cetera. But it's not about, oh, there's 65 million people. How many million people are in Turkey now? 70 million people in Turkey. 70 million people, I'm gonna get 1% of 70 million, um, and, that, and I'm gonna charge, you know, make $3 from every person that I get, and that's how I'm gonna make my profit. It's not that. It's how are you gonna get your first customer? How are you gonna get your second customer? How are you gonna get to 10 customers? And it's really being able to digest um, the risk that's associated with it, and converting some of those early people into your partners so they're giving you constant feedback. And I think that that goes back to exactly what you were saying before. Um, and last but not least, it's balancing tactics with strategy. I mean, every day we're putting out fires, right? You're running here, you're running there, you're making appointments, etc. But you have to make time to sit down and, and go back to your business plan quarterly and be like, okay, what did we think we were gonna do? What did we do? Why did we not do it? And that, again, ties back to mindfulness. Like, it's kind of this, this little shark. Namaste to you all. I, I'm being very, very zen. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you, and I'm really excited about meeting everyone. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>